Good morning to you all. Good morning. Good morning. Have you ever had that feeling that you've met old friends for the first time? <laughs> so hi, old friends. Uh, I know a couple of you here, but uh, I have spoken to Al before, but it was a local chapter. So I'm very familiar with Al. There's been a very active Al chapter in my hometown of Lawrence, Kansas for a long time. Uh, so in many respects, it's wonderful to be here. And my challenge in talking to you this morning is how to narrow down the list of things that we have in common that we can talk about. I mean, this, we really are not scheduled to stay all day. Uh, but there's so much that we're working on together that, that we could. Uh, it's wonderful to talk to advocates. I have a long-standing core value belief in the, the, the role of advocacy. Uh, advocates um, outside of government have a different role than those of us who work in the government, but we all have to play our part in terms of advocacy. Uh, since Margaret was talking briefly about your history, I thought I'd tell you what I was doing in the 70s, because that's where you started when you were formed. Um, I am the lucky generation to be able to proudly say that I'm a feminist, raised by a feminist, uh, who are, and my sister and I uh, are raising the next generation as well. So in the 70s, I grew up near Wichita, Kansas, in the 70s, my mom went back to college and discovered the women's studies courses at Wichita State University. So my sister, my father, and I spent most of my teenage years listening to her read from her textbooks and follow us around the house. And it always started with, now listen to this, and she'd be reading from her women's studies textbooks. My mom ended up getting a minor in women's studies, and was one of the first ones at Wichita State to do that in the 70s. And now my niece, who's a junior at the University of Colorado, is calling my sister and my mother and I to tell us about our women's studies classes, uh, you know, 30, 40 years later. So uh, it's wonderful uh, to be here uh, with, uh, with feminists and a, and a feminist organization focused on older women. This is, aging is, uh, a women's issue. Uh, there are very few opportunities that I have to go talk to audiences who see it in that same way and look at things from a different lens. Uh, I talk um, a lot, and I won't, I won't make extensive comments in this area, but I talk a lot about one of the wonderful opportunities about my position, representing the United States uh, in the area of aging, is to do some work internationally. And I don't have a lot of chance, but I've been to Australia, and I had a chance to do an AARP international event and talk to some people from other countries when they come here. And you only have to get outside of ourselves here in this country to really see that this is aging is an issue that affects women, and aging is a poverty issue, and all of those three things intersect for women. That you can't look at aging without talking about women and poverty as well. And I think it's important to realize that you could slice the Affordable Care Act from many different lenses. You could look specifically at women, which is what you've done. You could look at poverty in the Affordable Care Act. You could look at health disparities in the Affordable Care Act. And each of those reports really would cover almost every section of the Affordable Care Act. It's really meant to address uh, access to health care, access to services, and, and equality of access. And I think it's just wonderful that you have focused on this for your Mother's Day report. I, in looking at the foreword for your report and the list of the prior reports that you've done, the ones at least that are listed here, uh, you have touched on many of these same issues, like I'm telling you, many of these same issues in the last few years, elder abuse, caregiving, long-term care, it's all in there. So you must have had to reread everything you thought in order to talk about what's happening now because you have been tracking these same issues for a very, very long time. I wanted to just talk about a few and take some questions from you, and really, it could be very broad. I, I want to talk about the Class Act and you know, where we are. I want to mention prevention. I want to talk about elder abuse. And I want to talk about care transitions because I think this is a very um, dynamic portion of the law and a place that we all need to be paying attention to. It's a very person-centered piece of the law that I want to talk about. So let's start with class. There are, there's so much known about the need for long-term supports that my major concern right now about the class act, we're spending a lot of time looking at implementation, is that we not lose track of the need the underlying conversation, the fact that we cannot afford, most people cannot afford in this country, long-term care uh, for the length of time that they may, may need long-term care. And when we talk about aging, we talk about as you age, we have increasingly more women than men because just the gender differences and the mortality tables. 
that as you age, you have more and more women who will rely upon long-term care. Long-term care is clearly a women's issues. Issue. And you also have increasing number of women who are caregivers. So not only, I mean, the average caregiver in this country is a 46-year-old woman who's married, uh, raising children, the sandwich generation, taking care of parents. So you have women aging, women providing care, and as we uh, really reap the benefits of longevity and health, you have more aging women as caregivers for their spouses. So it's, it's all sort of building, and, and the, the stress of, of, of caregiving, the, the need for long-term care, all underpin the public conversation about the Class Act. There are things the Class Act is designed to do and things that it's not designed to do. The Class Act is not designed to be comprehensive long-term care insurance. I mean, it's, it's, it's a different kind of product and difficult to describe sometimes because it exists in a place that's not been before. I mean, the Class Act is supplemental help. It's not full service. And it's interesting to do some work with focus groups and other people because talking about long-term supports is a challenging, challenging issue. Everybody will need it, and everyone can't figure out how they're going to manage when they get there. I mean, so you have a complete understanding of the need and sort of a paralysis about a paralysis of what we do. The Class Act exists in the middle. The benefit design is that there would be a cash benefit for someone, I can explain the structure, but a cash benefit uh, it, delivered in the form of a debit card, which is interesting. So oh. someone who is uh, receiving benefits from the Class Act will receive an average of $50 a day cash. And that's supposed to be sent, spent to support their long-term services and support needs. It's a very consumer-centric program. It's designed to deliver cash to an individual for them to make decisions about what they need and will need to be very broad in approach. We can't be overly prescriptive about what people need uh, to put together to help themselves. The average annual benefit then is $18,000 a year. That's not gonna pay for nursing home care or assisted living. But $18,000 a year paired with someone's social security, their retirement, provide additional options and help to stay in the community. And it will help caregivers because the care recipient has cash. And the care recipient can pay family members <coughs> to provide care, pay um, strangers outside professionals to provide care, can provide the kind of assistance, um, buy the kinds of things that caregivers also have to buy right now. I mean, when you talk about caregivers, they will say, this is physically demanding because I'm doing physical care. This is expensive because I'm using my own money. And so if you go back to the care recipient and provide them with more assets and options, it will help the caregiver who's the partner at the table to figure out how to buy some of these supports so the caregiver can still be there but have more, um, really, quite literally, money on the table. It's designed to work. It is an insurance product, and there are many people who talk about this from different angles. Uh, it was um, one of Senator Kennedy's uh, final kind of pieces of legislation that he was supporting. Uh, there are many members of the Asian community, of the disability community, who've worked very hard for this program. It's a workers' program. It's an insurance product for workers. It's always designed to be um, available to people who are working. Earlier versions of the bill included a spouse. That's not in the final language. Someone who's working. And so you have to be 18, you have to make a certain amount of money, you have to pay in for five years in order to access the program. <coughs> it's really designed for people who are in the workplace. And it's also an insurance product, which means we have to look at it from a solvency point of view. And there are some um, challenges with the way the law was written. Uh, it is a voluntary program. Now, when you put voluntary and insurance together, you immediately have to talk about how are we going to get the right number of people <coughs> and a big number of people. And it's not medically underwritten. It's designed so that people have universal access because nearly everyone will need this kind of care. But not being underwritten and not being mandatory creates a serious dialogue about how you protect the solvent.